motor skills into your daily routines to help your child who has a visual impairment. And today, whenever we talk about gross motor skills or gross motor development, we're referring to any movements that involve the large muscles or large um, movements and gestures. So that would be some of our sitting, walking, and we'll go through more of that as we go. Um, but just keep in mind, that's what we're talking about when we're talking about gross motor skills and activities. So I'm Colleen Kickbush. I am a teacher of the visually impaired at Vision Forward Association. And I do work with kids um, really birth to age 21 because I do still work with school age kids as well. Um, I did work for about six years in the Milwaukee Public Schools. And now I've been at Vision Forward for four and a half, almost five years. Um, and at Vision Forward, I do mostly serve um, children ages birth to three from a, mostly the Milwaukee area, but also across the state. And I'm Jenna Zubella. I'm a physical therapist at Vision Forward. I've been there for almost four years now. And I'm, I see kids from birth to 21. My typical age range right now, though, is about three to like 10 is my typical age range that I see. So at Vision Forward, um, just a little about us, our mission is to empower, educate, and enhance the lives of individuals impacted by vision loss through all of life's transitions. So at Vision Forward, we do see adults too, but Colleen and I um, work in the children's wing. Yeah, and for those of you who don't know, um, Vision Forward Association is in Milwaukee, um, but we do a lot of virtual services for families across the state, and we do also um, have families who visit when they come in to see their doctors at Children's Hospital. Um, and if you need anything, like we have support groups and other resources for families, just reach out and we can help you out. Um, today, Jen and I wanted to talk to you um, and help you understand how vision loss, um, including if you have a child with cortical envisionment, visual impairment, how that impacts their gross motor development. We also just want to help you identify some of those um, red flags for gross motor deficits in your children, um, including children with multiple disabilities. And then we'll help you um, to come up with, to create and implement some of the gross motor activities, especially during your daily routines, just to get them moving more. So we're going to start off with a little um, background or information that you guys should all have and then we'll get into the fun stuff at the end. So gross motor development. Um, the CDC actually has a really really good handout that has what typical development is that you can check off as you go um, as your child is growing up um, and you can find that online on, at the CDC website but it's um, like a little book that you can check off. They're social, emotional, they have fine motor, they have gross motor, they have speech, all of that kind of stuff in there. Um, but for gross motor, typically rolling, um, they're rolling from their back to their side at about three to four months. They're rolling um, from their tummy to their back at about five to seven months. Um, they're sitting independently between six to eight months with protective responses um, at about nine months. And I, I'm going to guess what you, some of you are thinking is what are protective responses? So we're going to do a little fun activity. Um, usually if you have a partner, this is a good one to partner up with. If not, um, you guys can do it in sitting. And what you guys are going to do is if you have a partner, um, one of you is going to sit on the ground and the other person is going to gently nudge them in different directions. And if you put your hand on the ground to catch yourself, that's your protective response going. Um, if you're all by yourself, what you guys can do is you guys can reach really far to the sides, really far forward until you feel like you're going to tip that way. And that's your protective responses kicking in. So if you guys want to take a couple seconds and try those out. And yep, I see somebody tipping their son back and forth. That's a really good way to work on those protective responses. Okay, I see people like having the conversation. One of you's got to get on the floor and sit. <laughs> Come on, you can do it. You know who I'm talking to. <laughs> That's hilarious. They totally knew who I was talking to. <laughs> and if you're able, if you're by yourself, try sitting on the floor to do it as well. But you can do it in a chair if you have to also. But 
so this is a really good way to to like kind of test that out um, with your child too is you can sit and just gently nudge in different directions to kind of throw them off balance a little bit or if they're sitting on your lap you can tip them side to side to see if they put their hands out to the ground to catch themselves okay we will go back to our presentation um, but this will not be the last time you guys are moving today so be ready <laughs> So um, some other just basic ones, um, standing at a surface around seven to eight months, independently standing, so they're standing in an open environment or without something to hold on to with their hands at 10 to 11 months, um, and they're walking around 12 months to 15 months. If they're not walking by 18 months, that could be like a red flag, so you might want to get a PT eval. So we'll go into red flags. So some red flags for that you would potentially need a PT eval um, or a PT to just look at them would be hyper or hypotonia. So that's low tone or high tone in their muscles. So if they're really, um, really loose and kind of have a hard time sitting, that might be low tone. If they're really tight, like you have a problem changing their diaper, because their legs are really tight, um, getting shoes and socks on, that it would be more high tone. If they have a side preference, so if they really kind of ignore one side of their body or they don't wanna use their left hand or their left foot at all and kind of just ignore that whole left side, that would be a side preference. And that's really common in kids who have visual impairments, especially if they have um, lower vision in one eye than the other. Um, that's something really common that you might see is they might have a harder time using, um, you know, their arm or their leg or really prefer the side where they have the better vision. Um, if they're not lifting their head when they're on their tummy at four months, so that's kind of your elbows are on the ground, they're lifting their head up. Um, if they don't want to put any weight through their feet when you're holding them at their trunk at about four months. They're not rolling by six months. Um, some other ones would be not walking by 18 months. Um, if they have really poor balance or they're falling a lot when they're walking um, or if they're not going up and down the stairs by the time they're three years old and that can be climbing or walking up the stairs. Okay, so impacts of vision on gross motor development. So gross motor development may be delayed in children who are blind or visually impaired, and that is because they, a lot of kids to develop gross motor, um, they use incidental learning or they are watching what you're doing or watching what a sibling is doing to see how to move. And if you lack that, they might have lack motivation to move. So you might have to look at other ways to get them motivated to move, which we will go over some other fun ways to do that later on today. Um, and they might just have a fear of the unknown because they can't see far away. So they don't know if it's, am I going to, if I crawl forward, am I going to fall off a step? Or is there something that I'm going to run into? So they might have that fear of the unknown. If you do have a child who has a cortical visual impairment, um, that's when the visual impairment is more because of something that's happening in the pathways in the brain or the visual centers of the brain um, versus a condition with really the eyeballs itself. Um, if your child has a cortical visual impairment, um, some of their visual or behavioral characteristics that they have because of that could actually hinder some of the development of their gross motor skills also, um, especially um, if they have a visual field preference, or if they have that um, difficulty with distance viewing, um, or if they have a hard time um, because of the complexity of the environment or how busy or cluttered it is. And we'll go over some of this when we talk about the accommodations later. Um, but I do also want to let you know that um, one of the handouts that's in the live binder with the presentations is called Cortical Visual Impairment um, Impact on Gross Motor Development. And it's a chart that has um, all the visual and behavioral characteristics of CVI. There are 10 areas. Um, not every child has every area, but you can look and see which ones might affect your child. Um, do they see better when things really move? Um, or do they seem to only have one area that they like to look at or one side? Um, so there's different things you can look at on there to see how it might impact their motor skills and then adaptations that you can make in your home um, to make them more successful. 
So as Jenna said, um, vision really does facilitate some of that cognitive development. Um, exploration of your environment is really critical to concept development. Um, and when kids don't have that incidental learning, um, that can really be hindered. Um, so working really specifically on um, gross motor skills can really help them also develop their cognitive abilities. Um, vision also does give us that reason for movement. When they see something that you are doing or a sibling, they really will be motivated by it and will want to move um, forward. So, you know, they might move toward their mom that's in front of them. Well, we know, and we'll talk about this more later, um, we'll have to provide some accommodations or some, you know, supports in the environment. You know, maybe we have to use our voice more to get them to call, um, to come over or some toys that make noise. Uh, but there's things that we can definitely do to help our children. Um, they can develop these gross motor skills just like all other children. Um, so vision provides feedback and a model for refining the pattern of movement. So a great example of this is if you're thinking about shooting a basketball. So if you take a basketball and you shoot it towards the basketball hoop and it misses off, you hit the right side of the basketball or the um, backboard, you're, you can do a couple of things. You see that it missed, so you're going to change how you're either throwing the ball up there or where you're standing to make yourself successful with that. Um, so that's kind of a really good example of the visual feedback loop that you're getting. Um, when another example is a child watching other uh, another child do something or the way that they move, they're climbing up on a swing set, they're going to go try that. And if they um, trip on the first set, maybe they're going to figure out how to move the rest of the way up. Um, another um, thing for impact on vision is vision is a component of balance. So your balance system is made up of three different areas. Your vestibular system, um, which is like your inner ear and um, tells you like where you are. Your proprioception, which is in your joints, you have proprioceptive um, receptors that tell you where your joints are in space. And then you have your vision. So if you have a decrease in one of them, you need to compensate and rely on the other ones more. So I'm going to have everybody stand up. Come on, everybody. I'll do it, too. <laughs> Fair enough, too. So we're going to start. We're going to do a couple different things. So you guys are going to stand um, up, not leaning on anything, not holding on to anything, and just stand for a couple seconds. So you guys, eyes are open. You're not moving around a lot. The next one I'm going to have you guys do is I'm going to have everybody close their eyes while they're standing. So now we're taking vision out of that balance component. So everybody's going to stand with their eyes closed. You might move a little bit more or sway a little bit more. Uh, that is okay. And then Colleen wants everybody to also try closing just one eye while they're standing. And kind of like think about how you're like, are you moving more with your eyes closed, with your eyes open? So now we're going to get a little tricky. Everybody open your eyes and stand on one foot. And now close your eyes with that standing on one foot. So you're you probably going to move even over. more that time, but don't fall over. <laughs> a fun kind of way to see how your balance you're using all those inputs and components of that and we all know we all know it's not exactly the same as what our children who are visually impaired may be going through but it at least gives you a little bit of an idea of why things can be a little tough for them oh I love seeing the kids try it too yes. <laughs> thank you all for playing along with us we appreciate it okay so some tips to improve gross motor skills. Um, so know which equipment they need for each task. So if your child needs something to help them sit up, know kind of what to use before you do that task. Um, if they need something to help them walk, if they need their white cane to help them walk, having that ready before you go do a gross motor task is um, very important. Um, do they need help standing? Do you need to help them stand? Do they have to use a stander? Those kind of things to get them um, set up for the most success with gross motor activities. Um, and that kind of goes with optimizing position. 
Um, you can also do gross motor breaks in between um, sitting down or fine motor or vision activities if they're working on reading a book or if they're working on short sorting shapes out. You can take breaks away from there where they're sitting at a table maybe and go do a movement or go do jumping or dancing or swinging or heavy work activities. So like heavy work would be pushing something. They can push the laundry bin down the hallway. They can pull the laundry bin down the hallway. They can um, push or pull a wagon outside. Uh, standing against the wall with your hands on the wall and having them do like wall push-ups would be a good one. Um, inchworm walking, so hands go first and then their feet come back up to their hands. Hands go out, feet go forward. Those are all great ways to do gross motor breaks in between some of those um, harder like sitting activities where they're really working on their vision or they're really working on their fine motor. You can also change the surface they're working on. So if they're getting good with sitting or standing on a solid surface, you can change that to sitting or standing maybe on a pillow or on a couch cushion that gives them a little more give so they have to work a little bit harder for that. Another good one with it being starting to get warm outside is changing um, like a sensory surface. So maybe if they're really good standing in, in the house, now take them out to the grass and have them stand barefoot on the grass and see how they do. It's gonna be a little different. Or if you have like hills in your yard, you can have them stand on a hill and do activities. Um, and one really good thing to help improve gross motor skills is to really involve the whole team. So you're talking to your PT, if you have one, you're talking to OT, you're talking to the TVI, O&M, speech, you can kind of combine all of those and use everybody together to really get the most success. And Jenna, I just wanted to show a couple of the things that I've learned to find very useful since working with you. Um, this have to do with positioning, um, but could you explain to everybody, this everyone is just a phone book. So if you ever wonder what to do with your phone book at home, if you don't use it anymore, um, this one is just a phone book wrapped in contact paper. You can also do it with old textbooks that you might have or things. Duct tape, you can wrap them with duct tape up and you can use that as a like a little step for them to step up on. You can use it um, to sit on if you need. If they're sitting in a chair and maybe they're slouched really far back, you can put it behind their back to help them sit up straighter in the chair. Um, <laughs> so you can kind of use the phone books for a lot of things. So don't oh, get rid of them, feet. tape them up. Under their feet, if they're sitting in a yep. chair and they don't touch the ground, that's a big one. And that really helps a lot of my students when they're trying to do fine motor tasks and use their hands. If their legs are swinging around, sometimes they lose their balance more or have a harder time using their hands. So I like putting them under their feet on the floor to give them a little, you know, an easier time sitting still. Oh, and then we also have the non-slip grip. Have you all seen this? You can get this at the dollar store. I should have taken some out. Um. <laughs> it's like the shelf liner yeah. for um, like your closet or stuff like that. It's a really good thing to just kind of cut pieces of and you can put it on a chair. You can put it on the ground that maybe is a little slippy, slip, slippery or I can't say that word, but um, you can put it underneath them to give them a little bit more grip to the ground if you're standing on it or if you're putting, um, like the book that Colleen just had, if you're putting the phone book down, you can put the, um, non-slip underneath it so the book doesn't move as much on the ground you're on. Yeah. Okay. So here's some more. You can start if they're really not sure about walking yet or um, want to always hold on to your hand or holding on to something, you can have them hold on to a ball or a box or a bucket. Um, a sand pail is a really good one because they can hold it with their hands and you can add things in it to help weight it down a little bit. Um, that might help a little bit with their balance. You can give them a target to walk to. So with um, CBI, if you, if your child likes a specific color, um, so, so let's say they like red, uh, you can have that at, you know, a couple feet in front of them and have them walk to it and then they can get the input. You can use a light source. So if they like a red light, you can have something with a red light at the end of the hallway. Um, you can mark like their bedroom with things. So if you can put a like a circle. I'm going to put a circle outside your bedroom door so you know it's your bedroom door. I'm going to put a square outside the bathroom if you're working on shapes so they can start to identify different rooms in your house. 
um, providing boundaries for them. So a lot of um, kids with a visual impairment, they're really fearful of walking until they start to use those canes. So giving them a boundary to even sit in a chair with boundary around them, or I like to use hula hoops a lot of times when they're learning to walk um, so they can feel secure all the way around the hula hoop. Um, they can push a toy, you can push a shopping cart, um, and then considering order of ease. So it's easier to start doing activities on the same side. So if their vision is better on the right side, you're going to start on the right side. Then you're going to move to reaching, so you could reach off to the right. Then you're going to move to reaching toward closer to the middle. And then you're going to work on reaching to the left. So you're going to cross midline now. And then I'll let Colleen finish up for this one. Yeah, and it's easier to do things closer to your body um, at the middle. So a lot of times when kids are little, um, we do work on them finding things in the middle here. Um, and that's going to help them keep their balance and, you know, be able, and, but then eventually we we'll do want to start moving them above or below. Um, and you really do have to keep in mind where their vision is best, uh, because it will be more difficult when you're moving away from that. So um, you know, if they have a visual field loss or a preference, like, you know, maybe they see things up high better, that's going to be easier for them to get things up high than it would be to go down low to get them. Um, and you might just have to pay attention to where their head needs to be in space. Um, I know a lot of PTs are very much, you know, obviously we don't want kids straining their necks, but some of our children with visual impairments really do have to hold their head in a certain um, way to see best. Um, so just keep some of those things in mind. Um, and like I said, also you can refer to the um, chart that we did start up. And this isn't all inclusive. It's just some ideas to get you started. Um, if you do have a child with CVI, make sure you look at some of the adaptations that could really help them because um, those will help them improve their gross motor skills. Okay, so before we go on to this part, does anybody have any questions? And you can just speak up. You don't have to do the chat if you don't want to. <laughs> there isn't any in the chat right now. Perfect. Okay, well then we will start with um, some environmental accommodations. So during all of this, we'll be giving um, examples of, uh, for each of the um, accommodations, we'll give some examples to do. Yep. So these are just some of the things, when we say accommodations, I'm sure you've probably heard this word, especially if your children are school-aged already, um, but these are just some of the visual supports um, or supports, other sensory supports um, that you can provide them. Um, and these ones, when it says environmental, they're things that you can do to change the environment that will actually help them use the vision that they do have better or use their sense of touch or hearing to learn, um, which will also actually improve their ability to do the gross motor skills. Um, something that's really important and very easy to do is to think about the lighting in the environment. Um, so think about what room you're going to be in. You know, maybe you're in the kitchen for a certain thing and you want them to, you know, climb in their high chair. Well, think about what the lighting is there. Is the light shining toward their eyes and then they can't see where the chair is as well, um, especially if they need to step up and be safer. Um, so think about some of those things. And here's what you can do to kind of help with that and some activities that you can work on to make their vision um, better or help them use their other senses. So if you're working on like making an obstacle course, so you want to work on going over obstacles, crawling under things, maybe going through a tunnel, you're going to want to make sure that if you have a child that needs more light, that the light is appropriate. So it's not like Colleen said, not shining in their eyes, but you have good overhead lighting. Or if you're working on stairs, making sure there's lights on on the staircase. Um, I think that's a big one sometimes is that in the rush of things during the day, maybe the lights are on or maybe the light switch is down on the first floor and you're, you guys are coming down in the morning and it's a little darker, turning on, maybe going before your child and having your child wait and turn on that light switch so that when you take your child down the stairs, the light is on so the, the stairs are easier to see for them. Um, we kind of already talked about this, but using like lighted toys at the end of a hallway or somewhere to walk towards if your child has CBI. Um, you can also use kind of other things, making sure that when they're cutting things for like fine motor activities that they're um, 
the light is appropriate and not shining in their eyes. It's on the, um, the light is on the paper. Um, for feeding, our speech therapist likes to use a lighted spoon sometimes with our kids with CVI. So she'll take like a finger light that she, that um, like Colleen has, and she'll tape it onto the spoon at the end. So if they like red, they'll tape like a red light onto the spoon so that the child can find the spoon in the bowl. Yep. And uh, one big thing too, is if you are using any technology, I know kids are very motivated um, by iPads and other apps and games on computers. Um, so when you are watching TV or, you know, getting them to move toward a target like that, make sure that you turn off the lights or think about um, some of the glare. Um, so when we talk about eliminating glare, you want to make sure that it's just like when you guys are on your computer or watching these videos. You wanna think about where light might be coming from that could create like a reflection on the screens. Um, and the same thing can happen for kids who are visually impaired, um, just walking. So if they're walking outside um, in the winter time, you don't think about it being very sunny um, because it may be overcast and cloudy, but when there's that white snow on the ground, um, you really do, and I'm sure a lot of you have known, it seems so much brighter when that sun might be bouncing off the snow into your eyes. Um, so thinking about that and how that might affect their ability to move um, can really be, be helpful if you're taking that into consideration. So closing curtains a lot of times can help because you don't want that shining off of the target that they're trying to look at to walk toward. Um, and you also don't want you know, them getting that in their eyes when they're, they're trying to be safe and, and move safely. Another one too with eliminating glare is I like to do um, like maze walking on the ground with some of the kids. So I'll tape different lines out. So I'll start with like straight lines. They're just working on keeping one foot on the line and then we'll work on getting two feet on the line. And then maybe I add like a turn to it. I use painter's tape for that because you don't get a lot of the glare from an overhead light to it versus like using duct tape where you might get the glare hitting off the duct tape because it's a little shinier surface coming back up at the kids. Um, and painter's tape is a lot easier to get off your floor <laughs> too <laughs> than duct tape. It's a lot less sticky. So it comes up easy. It goes down easy. It's a fun activity to do. Um, you can have them help you what do you want to, what do you want to walk on today? Do you want to walk in a square or a triangle? And you can have them help you tape out a big triangle or a square on the ground. And then you guys can walk on it. Um, you guys can make mazes through the house with different directions. And painter's tape is really nice for the stairs too. I know some people don't have access to the really nice, like, you know, ADA compliant tape for stairs. Um, but if you want, if you feel like it would help your child with low vision, if you need to mark um, the top step and maybe the last step, um, painter's tape in different colors can be nice and you may have to replace it frequently, but it um, usually comes off of stairs, you know, wood stairs and things easier than some of the other tapes. Um, so, so some families prefer using it for that purpose as well for gross motor skills. Just make sure it's a high contrast color to whatever your color your floor is. So if your floor is like a white, then you're going to want to use like the blue or the green painter's mm -hmm. tape. And if you have a darker floor, you're going to probably want to use the green or sometimes I've seen that the they yellow. have the yellow color now yeah. or like a red or something, a bright red. Yep. Can so, I get a question in? Yes. Yeah. So you guys mentioned CVI a lot and there may be some mm -hmm. families out there that don't know what CVI is but may have multiple things going on with them physically and so and such. So do you re recommend um, any of those with multiple things going on or delayed to look over the CVI accommodations or not? Yes. So, so I was just going to say, even if your child isn't diagnosed with cortical visual impairment, um, and as I explain later, that's where the visual impairment comes more from. And it's, it's more common, I will say, in kids with multiple disabilities, but it is possible to have CVI if you, you know, are, are, that could be your only um, condition. Um, but that's where it's a neurological because of brain damage to either that visual center in the brain, which is the occipital lobe, which is in the back. Um, otherwise, it's sometimes damage along the pathways in the brain, and it just changes how kids are able to interpret what they're seeing. Um, so it might just be it's not always something's wrong with their eyes. It could actually be that their brain isn't really processing or interpreting properly what is in front of them. Um, and so some of the things on that chart 
Well, I will say, even though it says that specifically for CVI, they would help a lot of kids who have low vision um, or other multiple disabilities as well. Um, so one uh, suggestion on there, um, this is a big one, and this really is for kids with any, and we'll get to some more of these as we go, but a lot of kids see better um, if they have low vision, if something is moving. Um, so just providing some of those movement of object cues. So if you want them to walk toward a target, they might not even see where that target is that you want them to walk towards. So kind of giving it a little shake um, and getting their visual attention that way may actually help them get to it um, easier. So some of those things might be really nice. Um, providing wait time is a really big one um, and that'll work for any children. Um, and a lot of those things that are on that chart would also help when kids have multiple disabilities. Um, I hope that answers your question, Trish. I, Jenna, do you have things to add to that? I don't know. I think um, a lot of the adaptations too you can use with a child with just low vision. I mean, like Colleen said, the high contrast things. Oh, that's every, make, not, I shouldn't say everybody, but that's a lot of make children. Make sure right that now. you're using high contrast things, especially with gross motor activities, if you're doing them, because they're going to be focusing more on that gross motor activity and maybe not as much on their vision when they're moving through space. So that high contrast is going to give them even more help with that. Yeah, and you, because you don't, you want to be, when, especially when you're working on new movements, you don't want to be testing their vision, what they yeah. can and can't see. So like Jenna said, you want to do whatever you can to make things as easy as possible to see. Um, so going through a lot of these, um, and you can find this information, like what will help your child the best by working with a teacher of the visually impaired, um, especially if they've had a functional vision evaluation. Um, that's where you would find a lot of these um, in a checklist usually form. Um, that the teacher would recommend that'll help your child too. So not every kid needs every single one of these, but as a rule of thumb, you do generally just wanna make things as easy to see as possible, um, especially in the environment so that they can focus, like Jenna said, on those gross motor skills. Well, um, we have a couple of things in the chat. Oh, perfect. Good. Trudy, um, great info, thank you. But um, that was from Trudy. And then Tiffany says the lighted toys worked well for Jack. It really allowed him to see yes. further than his visual acuity allowed him. He started yes. walking further than his eyes could see because he could see at least something in the distance. Before yes. using toys, he would only venture about three feet at a time. Yes, thank you for saying that. And I will show, um, I hope you can all see this because um, it's not dark in the room I'm in. Um, but I'm also, I'm showing like a four inch light cube and they sell these very inexpensively on Amazon. And you can actually get those finger lights we were talking about at the dollar store. Um, but this four inch light cube actually comes with a remote and can do like 20 different colors. Um, it also can do like a smooth changing of colors if your child does have that need for movement. So if they have a cortical visual impairment um, or like she said, any kids with low vision, Lighted objects really are very motivating. Kids like these things. Um, so this one I think on Amazon was, Jenna, was this like about 16 to $20, I think? I think so, yeah. Um, and what's nice is you can actually dim or bright, brighten also, um, which really helps. So I would have the lights off when I'm using that, but like you said, you could put it by a doorway. Um, maybe that's how they are able to independently walk to their, or crawl to their own um, door, their own bedroom, which helps on their, you know, that's improving their self-help skills and their independence. Rolling, if you're yeah. working on rolling with a child, um, to move it across their body to get them to start to roll because they'll want to reach towards that lighted toy. That's a yeah. good one. And through, well. um, through the American Printing House for the Blind, some of your children may qualify for special educational materials for free. Um, talk to your teacher, the visually impaired, about that if you haven't already. Um, but some families can benefit also through the use of a light box. And they have some really nice new ones that are smaller. Um, and they're perfect, especially if your child is younger. Um, and you can put pictures on them. You can also, like Jenna said, have your child work to rolling to them. They have other overlays, too, that can go on to make them different colors. Colors. Um, and those to certain kids who qualify, if your child's considered legally blind or functioning like that, they would actually maybe qualify for them for free. Um, so just keep that in mind too. Were there any other questions, Tricia? Or comments? Nope, that was it. 
Well, thank you guys for sharing. I love when people put helpful things in the chat because Jenna and I can talk about this all day, but especially if you have a child right there or experiences. Trudy, I know you have taught many, many children. Speak up if you have other examples too. We love it. Um, Jenna, you did already speak about the high contrast. And like Jenna said, this is probably yep. the easiest thing that you can do um, that can just make things so simple. And high contrast is just using basically the most opposite color that you can of the surface you're working on. Um, and it's, you have to think of the contrast of multiple levels sometimes. So really think about the floor or the surface, the main surface you're working on, um, as well as what are the objects that you want your child to find. Um, so a lot of times using like solid color backgrounds can help. Um, so if you are using a yellow toy, you might wanna have that black background. Um, and that really just helps also cut out some of the visual clutter or the complexity of your environment that we'll talk about in a little bit too. Um, but just making sure things are more the opposite color. Um, and I know Jenna has a few examples of activities and how you can do that in around your home. Yeah, so um, a good one is you can make high contrast like targets with construction paper. Um, you can cut out like circles and you can have them work on jumping from jumping from circle to circle to circle. You can cut out handprints and put them, you could tape them on the wall and you can do moving their hands across the wall if you're working on like cruising along the wall or you're working towards that walking. You can cut out feet so you can trace their feet on construction paper, cut them out um, and use them. And those are really inexpensive ways to work on um, gross motor movements that you can add to like an obstacle course that you're doing with them. Um, you can add it to even sitting in a chair and sometimes kids like to move their feet around a ton and you can give them like a target to go to. So put your feet back on your yellow feet that are on the ground. So put your feet on the yellow feet and they can work on keeping their feet quiet on the floor to make them more successful with whatever activity they're working on in sitting. Yeah, and I won't spend much time on the next one um, because I feel like it makes sense to a lot of parents. Use familiar objects as often as you can. Um, we really want you, your child to be able to see things the best they can. Um, so that's not a challenge when they are doing new movements. So especially if you're going to a doctor's office or you know, other environments that maybe aren't as familiar, try to bring some toys from home if you need to, to give them better targets that they can more easily see. Um, you know, or if they have something you know they can see better, choose those for the targets for them to, to move toward. Um, and we also want to provide really concrete objects for children, um, especially when they're younger. This is helpful. Um, so in your daily routines, make sure that you really are using objects, if you can, to get their hands on them. Um, some kids do really well with pictures um, and moving toward pictures on the wall um, or things like that, but also we just want to sometimes use those real objects. Have them walk to go get their diaper, um, you know, have them walk to go get their other shoe um, and find the match. Things that you can do to really incorporate some of that walking um, with real objects in their daily routines can be really helpful. And if they're working on uh, like you're working on stepping over things with them. You could have them, you could have everything that they need to get dressed for that day. So a pair of shoes, a socks, pants, and a shirt on one side of their room. And you can use great things to step over are brooms, um, wrapping paper rolls. They're usually something that are readily available in your house that you can lay out and they can work on go get me a sock. Go get me one of your socks. So they have to walk over those things and get bring you back a sock and then go get me a shoe. So you can kind of make it like that following direction. And they're still working on multiple things. They're working on getting their clothes independently. They're working on following directions. They're working on gross motor skills. And then once they have all of their clothes, um, helping them get dressed. So you're working on that fine motor or that OT that wants to work on ADL kind of skills. That would be a fun way to kind of incorporate everything into in the morning, which I know is busy sometimes, but if you have maybe on a weekend where you're less busy, where you can sit and you can take the time in the morning to work on that, that would be a good time to do that. Or at night when you're getting pajamas or something. Um, I believe I mentioned the complexity um, in the in some of the earlier slides, but this is something that really helps um, children who have low vision. Um, 
reducing the complexity in their environment, when we're talking about that, it can actually be three different areas that we look at. So you want to think about the complexity of the object. So we want to make things as simple as possible to see for our children. Um, and so when you think of complexity with an object, think about what color it is. Could you use an object like a ball when you're playing ball that has a single color, like maybe a bright yellow ball, um, especially when you're working out in the grass outside in the summer, um, thinking about that because that helps with the contrast. Um, they also may have a color preference if they have a cortical visual impairment, so you can keep that in mind. Um, and also size. When you're thinking about the complexity of the object too, you do really want to consider what size something is in comparison to the environment and how far it gets away. Um, and then also the complexity of the array, that's when we're talking about how many objects are in the child's environment at one time. Um, and you really want to reduce the amount of clutter. Um, so sometimes you, especially when you're working on new movements, you don't necessarily want to have too many things. You want to just have that one target that's going to be really easy for them to focus on and move toward um, because you don't want them questioning, oh, there's three things or five things over there. I'm not sure one I'm supposed to be reaching or walking toward or rolling toward. Um, so really limiting the array or limiting, that's also limiting the complexity or reducing the complexity in their visual environment. Um, we also think about sensory inputs. Um, so sometimes reducing other distractions in the environment. So allow them to really focus on their bodies and the movements that they need to be doing. Um, think, is, think, allow them to focus just on their arms. So sometimes using the tactual cues, like touching the body part that you want them to use. Um, if they're rolling, you want to, you know, touch that hip or leg that they're supposed to move over. Um, doing some of those things instead of having lots of sounds in the environment. Um, like we definitely recommend, I think one of the things that Jenna would probably agree with is limiting the TV and like music and other things in the environment if that's not the target you want them to go toward. Um, so obviously sometimes we motivate kids by having a sound toy, like they have to walk to, you know, the toy piano to keep it playing. Um, that's a little different, but you don't want them focusing on their other senses. You want to focus more on the movements or the, the thing that they should be focusing on using the most. So sometimes limiting the senses can help. We have a comment. Yep. Oh, yep. Real quick, yeah. um, we are not sure if you will be getting to this, but do you have any ideas for children that have no vision at all with no light perception? Are there motivators or ideas other than sound toys? Yeah. So you can use um, different texture things. So um, you can use rough textures and smooth textures, soft textures, um, bumpy textures, and you could have them crawling along those. So like sensory tiles that you could make. So you could take um, like those foam pieces that you can kind of put together. Um, you can put different things on them. You can like different textures. So the soft on one and rough on the other. And you can make like a little pathway for them to go down the hallway where you can do rolling on that. You can do walking on that. You can do crawling on that. Um, you can do bare walking on that. So hands and feet on the tiles all the way. A lot of the boundaries that you talked about, Jenna, are really nice for kids who are totally blind, like the hula hoop, um, mm -hmm. as well as creating like pathways with pillows or other things. Yep. Um, using L-shaped sectional couches is always really nice for cruising um, to get them to learn different directions and having to change directions in a safe way. Um, so yeah, we go for that tactual sense a lot of times. I also did, I think you guys could see when I held up a dangle bar, um, and that's one of the things that we're going to suggest for an activity later, um, but that's a really a nice way to provide, um, and I can show it again. Um, this is really helpful with moving. So I don't know whoever put that in the chat. If you want to let me know maybe how old your child is, then I'll know. Um, <laughs> but that's something that's nice for working on rolling um, or if you have a child with multiple impairments. I believe this child will be two and a half. Okay. okay. Oh, almost three old, three years oh. old. Yep. Sure. So um, you can and use... other diagnoses as well. Okay. okay. So you could use, um, now that they're starting to come out again, like the little plastic pools that you can get at Walmart, or sometimes you can get them at like Dollar General, um, you can fill those with different tactile things too. So cutting up like pool noodles in there to make them into like little discs kind of things and putting them in there, that's going to give them, especially if it's the smallest one, that's going to give them 
the freedom to move in there, but still give that boundaries so they get a little bit more movement than maybe sitting in a chair, but they still can find the boundaries all the way around. Um, and you would you don't have to put water in that. You could put different things in there like rice and beans, um, like bean bucket, rice bucket for them to explore um, to kind of move through. You can use um, with like the dangle bar like Colleen had, just getting them to like move their arms up away from their body or move their legs up when they're laying on their back. Um, you can put different things on there like the metal measuring spoons or measuring cups are a really good one to tie on there. Um, Colleen, you got any other stuff to tie on there? And honestly, I'm just going to say too that I'm just going to go really quickly through the rest of these accommodations because I can tell their parents are getting antsy to see our activities because these are all in our activities section. So Jenna, is it okay if I kind of go real quick yes. through these other ones? We, yes. we do have one more comment. Can I oh. mention the one more comment? No, yes. Go ahead. We took my son to the gymnastics classes at the YMCA right after he started walking. It was a lot of work for us parents to manipulate him into different positions but he loved all the movements along with being near other kids. The movements forced him to cross midline, which with CVI, he has not been fond of. Yeah, no, and that's great. Uh, you, you wouldn't believe how motivating it is to be around other kids. Even if they're not seeing everything the other children are doing, they're hearing things they're doing. They're feeling what these other children are doing by interacting with that equipment. And I love that whoever did that, that you're giving your child experiences. And that's just what we want to kind of motivate you to do is think about gross motor in terms of everything. I mean, it might just be being in a different environment encourages a child to you know, learn a little more head control because maybe they hear a, a new voice or hear someone playing or laughing and having fun and they turn their head and, you know, to try to see where it's coming from. So anything that you can really do and give your child new experiences can really help develop these gross motor skills. Um, but I'll go really, really quick. Um, the optimal positioning we talked about already, um, but make sure you're thinking about not only the position of your child's body, but also the positioning of the object. So make sure they are, if, they're ch if the child can see, make sure they're where they can see well. Make sure that if your child is totally blind, that you are helping them to locate objects with their hands um, and touching the things that are there before you're starting working on the new movements. Um, so sometimes in the beginning, you have to do you know, some of that extra verbal cueing and explaining what expectations you're going to have. Like, first, we're going to lift your hand, then we're going to reach, you know, and there's two toys here, and then go through and show them with their hands where each one is. Um, really doing that and setting up your environment and positioning beforehand, um, and making sure they have the proper seating or other equipment if they have um, other special needs is very, very important um, to making them successful. Um, we also do really recommend you building as much consistency as possible. Um, try to really do all of these activities in repetition. No child learns something by doing it once. You really have to do it a lot. Um, and make sure you always go in the same order. Sometimes using the same body parts, um, the same objects can really help them learn that. And then after they really get those new movements down, then they can apply it to other, um, other movements or other people or other objects. Um, and just, we already talked about the boundaries a lot. Um, and there is a short video here. This is Jenna working with a student um, at Vision Forward Association. Um, and it is a little, um, a little boy who she's showing how you can create boundaries using a hula hoop. So this is actually a child who has a cortical visual impairment and is, has multiple disabilities. And I can't even explain how amazing it is that Jenna was able to help this child walk. This is not a child that you would have ever expected to walk, and he just continues to amaze us all the time, but I'd love to show you this. So Jenna, do you want to explain like a little bit about yeah. what's going on? So he's kind of holding on to that hula hoop. So he was a kid that was not ready for O&M yet um, to hold on to anything. Actually, him holding on to the hula hoop was a huge accomplishment, um, and we were working on coming back to his classroom. So he was holding on to the hula hoop um, and I was kind of guiding him, but I was barely holding on to it. So he's kind of working on the balance himself where he's kind of tipping side to side. He's keeping his balance. Um, yeah, he did a great job. This was after 
he had used the walker for a little bit. So we were working on progressing from the walker um, to standing and walking potentially on his own. Um, so this is our kind of in-between thing because he was really unsure of walking without the walker. Yeah, and it really did help his um, visual skills as well. We were really working. I was his teacher, the visually impaired here um, when he was at school here. Um, and I will say that it really did help him improve his vision as well, um, because once he got up and moving, he was able to start, you know, having more visual um more visual stimulation and just more things that he could see and access in his environment. Um, and you actually saw him, he started learning how to scan a little bit better. So you'd see him turning his head because um, he did have a very specific visual field preference. And that was something that I love that Jenna ended up really helping me improve was his ability to kind of look around his environment and look for things and people. He followed a lot of auditory stuff too. So yep. he, he liked a lot of different sounds and a lot of people talking. So when he was walking through the hallway, you could tell when he was really listening because he would stop walking and he would turn his head to whatever direction the noise was coming from. And he was just starting at this time to start turning towards that noise. So turning towards the direction where the noise was coming from, which was really cool. Yeah, and we also did use a lot in the beginning when he first came, he um, pretty much just had light perception, um, a lot of eyes closed, head down, not really using his vision. Um, so we did start like that one family was saying, we started with lighted objects for him. Um, and those light cubes, the one I showed you is only four inches. They actually have some that come in like the 18 inch size that are very large. Um, and yeah, they get a little expensive, but um, that's something we have access to at centers and your children, if they're in school, may have access to as well. Um, but really giving him those targets really helped too. And then we'd pair them with sounds and other things. And then he'd get a texture or like something he could touch when he got to his target too as a reward. Um, so that's leading into this, make sure you use a multi-sensory approach. Um, so make sure things really do have they feel good. Um, you can use scents also to encourage children to move. I think I've used peppermint before. I have um, some students who have multiple disabilities who really, really alert to peppermint. Um, and so it actually increases their movement. And sometimes I'll do that before I do other activities when I want them to be, you know, just a little more alert, maybe, you know, starting to move their head a little bit. And the peppermint really does a big, makes a big difference. So don't forget about using their, you know, sense of, of smell um, or taste even can be very, very motivating for children. Um, I just want to throw this in there because a lot of parents don't know about this, but um, a lot of counties have something that's called the long-term support waiver or the waiver program. Um, and that's something that you can apply to from your county for a lot of kids and they'll help you get things for your house. So they could potentially help you buy light cubes for your house um, if you qualify for it. And a lot of kids with visual impairment do qualify for the waiver program. So that's something to look into depending on what county you live in. Um, you would have to go to the county website or you could ask your um, providers, so your therapists or stuff like that, they would be able to help you get some of that information. Yeah, I'm glad you added that in. Um, and please never stop, never stop talking to your children. Explain everything that you can in their environment, um, especially their, the expectation. What do you expect them to do? I, you know, and be as specific as possible. Tell them the body part that they're going to be using oh, I want you to, you know, walk forward. I want you to do righty, then lefty, then righty, then lefty. Um, really talking through some of those things. Um, and then you guys can read these slides later. I really want to get to the activities. Um, just I giving agree. them time is important and giving them the right cues. Make sure that you, you know, if they need just verbal cues, you do that. Um, otherwise, if they need physical assistance, try the hand under hand where you're guiding them towards something um, instead of you grabbing their hand and, and you know, because that can make them actually pull away or get be more fearful. Um, so thinking about how you're assisting them can be very important. Colleen, right? I think, yep, I think we've kind of already talked about that. Too. Good. Um, so this is the fun stuff. We get into some of the activities. So Jen, if you want to just touch on a couple of these and then we'll move through to our other activities. Yes. Um, so a couple different things you can do to make it, like make activities fun or make movement fun is to the little letters on the fridge. You can have them on there and then you can have the letter, like the letters written, like a word or something on a piece of paper and they have to bring you back the right letters. 
You could do that with textures. So matching textures, find me, I'm going to give you one to feel. And if it's a smooth one, then they have to go move or crawl to find the other smooth one and bring it back to you. Um, and you can even start with just two things, a smooth and a rough. So they're really different. Here's the smooth, it's on your right side. And here's the rough, it's on your left side. Um, and then you could hold up and have them feel it in front of them. Okay, here's the smooth one. Can you find the smooth one that's on either side of you? So they have to put their hands down maybe in sitting or if it's on their belly, you can put the smooth one on their belly and they have to find the, the one on their belly and touch it. And that could be them matching it together. Um, you can do shapes our letters on the wall. I have a lot of kids that are really um, interested in letters right now. So I'll tape letters up the stairway or down the stairway at home for the parents and they'll say, okay, you have to go bring me the J and they have to go find the J on the staircase, grab it and then bring it down. Um, they, I've done ones where they're standing and maybe they have a flashlight in their hand and there's letters taped on the wall and they maybe are starting standing on the ground and they have to point the flashlight to a different whatever letter is said or they have to toss a ball to whatever letter is said. Um, you could do that with colors too. So you could do point the flashlight to the green and they have to find it. You can make it harder by standing on a pillow or standing on a couch cushion. Um, I love obstacle courses for kids because I think they're so much fun to do. And especially as it gets warmer out, they're a lot easier to do outside. Um, and a lot of the stuff you can use for obstacle courses are in your house. So um, pool noodles, if you don't have pool noodles, I just saw a bunch at the dollar stores. The dollar store is coming out with pool noodles again. They're a great activity to step over. They're also a great, um, great thing to have for if you're sitting on a chair and maybe your child really needs boundaries. They're a great way to bring the chair in into them to give them those boundaries or to help with their posture sometimes. Um, pool noodles, you can do them in different shapes. You could do circles and they have to step through the circles. They maybe have to crawl through the circles, um, putting two chairs together and crawling through a tunnel. So you can put two chairs and then have like a lid to a big bin and they have to crawl under the bin. So you're working on those also those words like under and you're going over and you're going around. You can work on all those kind of concepts too. Um, yep. And the last one on this, um, where I talk about Lily Nielsen, um, there's this approach called the active learning approach that we use a lot with children. Um, and it's for all kids in promoting movement, but I know a lot of people who have um, children with multiple disabilities on top of their visual impairment really like this as well. But basically it's where you start with um, non-purposeful movements that children make and try to motivate them. Um, so these work really well for kids who have little or no vision as well. Um, so a lot of these things I showed you, the dangle bar is, is sort of getting to that, um, where if they, in the little room, and you can look on um, Active Learning Space is the website where you can find a lot of these materials and even show you how to make them um, or other ideas. Um, so it's basically where you want to encourage your children, even when they move and it's not on purpose. So it could just be them moving their head or moving a finger. Um, and you're going to have so many objects around them in their environment. And that's what the little room is, is like a little sensory environment. It's like the dangle bar, but it's a little room they lay inside of. Um, and it's basically encouraging anytime they move, even if it's not on purpose, they will get a reward for that, whether it's the sound of bells jingling or it's, oh, I... I moved my hand, I felt this pom-pom. Um, and you can hang things at different heights that are appropriate for your child, depending on their level of movement. Um, but it's basically building consistency. So when they, they know when they do that, that they got something out of it. So they learn some of that cause and effect. And that can really be important for children who are totally blind and encouraging this motor um, development. And, oh, the resonance board is also part of that. Um, it's a special board um, that you can make out of plywood that actually allows an echo to come underneath your child's body. So if they're like laying on it, anytime they move or, you know, move their leg, they get more sound coming from underneath them. Oh my goodness. We have so many activities on here. Um, I think, Colleen, before we give any more activities, Yes. I think, does anybody want to give 
some examples of activities that they do with their child that have worked or um, examples that maybe you've thought of now during this presentation before we give some more examples because we have a lot. <laughs> Does anyone want to share how they got their child to crawl or roll or walk or even lift their head to look at them or someone else? One thing I found helpful was look, working with little ones back in my day, um, <laughs> just like the dingle bar, is that what you're calling it? Yeah. We That's hung nice. things around a hula hoop. Yes. And we hung the hula hoop from the ceiling so it was above them and we got their arms to reach up and a um, little bit different of a way to use that awesome hula hoop that we can't live without when they're little. <laughs> exactly. No, thank you. That's a great one, Trisha. Thank you. So I will give a couple exam other examples that will hopefully get your thinking because we do have another activity at the end. Oh, does somebody else have one? I'm not seeing anything in the chat yet. Okay, so um, another one is you can go on an Easter egg hunt and you can do Easter egg hunts all year long. It does not just have to be at Easter. Um, so you can have beeping ones too. Yes, so you can put the eggs at different heights. Um, and have them go look for eggs around, or you can have them find a certain color, or like Colleen said, you can use the beeping eggs. Um, another fun thing to do is to match the sounds of eggs. So you can put different things in the eggs and have your child match the sounds. So if you set up something maybe in the yard where they're just working on crawling through the grass or walking through the grass, maybe you put eggs on like five eggs on one side and you have the other five that are the matching and you shake the egg and it has rice in it so you have to find the other egg that has rice in it so it has that same sound um you can do coins in the eggs you can do all beans in the eggs um there's a lot of fun things you can put in easter eggs um you can throwing a ball against the wall or kicking it against the wall and having it come back at them. So caveat to this one, you're going to want to be right there with them um, so that if it comes back too quickly, you can kind of redirect the ball. But getting that idea of the ball will come back to them or rolling the ball on the ground with them. If they need help sitting, you can sit behind them and have them work on rolling the ball to the um, wall and then it will come back to them. So if you're, if it's just you and your child and you don't have somebody else right there with you, that's an easy way to do work on rolling. Um, My personal favorite, singing songs or playing the social games that have gestures in them. So if you're happy and you know it, I'm a little teapot. All of those have the itsy bitsy spider. They all have actions and you can even make your own. Um, the important thing is just do the same actions consistently um, and in an order so your child can start to anticipate them. I have done the same verse. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands over and over and over. Um, but you can also add in other gestures and other activities that will be more helpful. Um, it could be as easy as um, if you're happy and you know it, lift your head. Um, I've done that when providing some cues. Um, those are really, really great. And you don't need really any materials for them a lot of time. It's just you and your child. So that's a really fun one. Um, I also really like using switch activated toys a lot um, or the voice output switches. So those are the buttons when, and I should have gotten an example out, but um, there's also ones that when you push it, they talk um, and say a recording that you have. So if you have a child who's nonverbal, you may be using that. Um, but switches are really nice, especially ones that activate toys. And if you have ones that are kind of the flatter button, you can even put those under a blanket um, so that if your child does like move their arm and puts their arm down or rolls, um, then they get to hear your voice or they get to hear their sibling's voice, or it could even be a favorite song, um, or maybe it moves the toy that they like um, that sings a song. So those are just some other activities to kind of get them moving more um, through yeah. play. We have something from Julie. Yeah. Um, she says that musical instruments have always been helpful getting her son engaged. Tambourines can get him to look in a direction or even having him utilize it himself. 
Thank you, Julie, for doing that. That is so true. Um, and we actually at Vision Forward, our, a lot of our kids get music therapy and Jenna really incorporates that well into her um, physical therapy session. So those things really do work nicely together. So if you have access to instruments or can make them, um, you can make them out of old um, paper towel tubes. You can put you know, some things inside. You can use um, those eggs, like the plastic eggs for shakers to make maracas. Um, so that's, thank you. That was a great idea. Um, we have a lot of things. Anytime you can work on their vestibular um, using swings, you know, rolling, trampolines. Um, a lot of kids will do rolling in blankets. That's always really fun. Um, and it kind of just gives that repeated direction. So they know the expectation like, oh, that's how I roll. I want to go, you know, around in a circle. And that's hard when you're blind to get that. Um, so working on those, um, and then we want you guys, sorry, you're going to have to talk now. No one can be quiet. Um, <laughs> we want you to see what type of activity you could come up with using some of these household items. Um, what type of activity could you come up with? So the first one we have is a diaper box. So when that diaper box is empty, or if you put things in, in, in it, what kind of gross motor activities could you come up with or uses for this box? Don't be shy. Hey, do I have to start calling on people? No, I'm just kidding. I promise all of you have ideas how to use this diaper box. I have something um, in the chat from Julie. My son would love to take fingerprint all over the box, forces him to. Yes, that is a great activity to use the box for. Yes. Um, that's I, awesome. would, I would like to put the box behind the couch or the chair and have the child up on the chair and drop balls into it so you can get that sound depth. Yep. yep. Yes, that's a great one. You could use it as a push toy, like pushing it across the room and walking. Yes, perfect. Oh, yep. Or even um, on their to get more of that core strength too. You can have them on their knees and you can put, you know, laundry in it maybe or something to weight it down a little bit and pushing it across the ground. That's gonna really work and walking on their knees, that's gonna really work on that tummy strength. Yeah, and putting things inside of the boxes that really roll around and make a lot of noise. Like if you get some of the cat toys from the dollar store that have like the little bell balls, those inside will really motivate your child, even if they're, you know, if they're totally blind, they'll really love that sound that they get when they push the box around. Katie would like to create a path with multiple boxes to cruise along through a room. Exactly. Perfect. Just make sure that you do weight them down um, or hold it down when your child is leaning, because as we know, different boxes kind of, you know, can tip and things. So just make sure you're safe and weight things down. Um, I've had people put rocks inside of them um, or just have your toys. Um, and you can also tape them up really nice with um, packing tape or duct tape too, so that, you know, they stay sturdier. Um, I know we had written down a couple other ideas. You can also just do stepping over the side, um, and that works on a little bit of problem solving to work on their cognitive development as well. Um, crawling into them. Um, ooh, one of my favorites when I do home visits for birth to three, um, we actually have a lot of children use these when they don't have a tray or a table to sit at. So we actually tip it over and work on sitting with their legs inside of the box with their arms on the top so that they can kind of push down a little bit. Um, so it's a nice little support surface for them. Um, yeah, and just working on in and out and some of those cognitive skills. Um, when children are totally blind, it's nice to do things in a really concrete way. Um, so when you have a child who's totally blind, working with them on getting in and out of a box, like you can say, oh, James is in the box. Now James is out of the box. You can put toys inside with them. Um, you can stand at the side and throw toys into the box, like Trisha was saying, or sit and drop them in. Um, all of those things are really wonderful. Um, and if you do really have it um, reinforced, you could also potentially use this as a step stool if you didn't have a step stool. Um, it depends what size your box is, obviously. Any other ideas anyone wanted to share before I move to the next one? Were there any other in the comments, Trisha? Nope, not yet. Okay. Um, and definitely working on other self-help skills. <laughs> Having your child walk to the box or crawl to the box and put things away inside of the box um, is really nice. So if you don't have any little storage baskets or bins, these boxes with the tops open can be really nice for that. 
Okay, so the next one we have are pillows or we'll throw couch cushions in there too. So who's got some ideas of how to use this at home? We'll get done faster if everyone starts speaking. No, I'm just kidding. We do have one from uh, about the box still that oh. just popped up. Um, to tape the boxes up and use them as building blocks as a gross motor task to then later relate to stacking smaller wooden blocks. That is an awesome one. Love that, that is, and that is one too that then you could stack them up, stack them up, and you can knock them over, um, either with their hands or they can roll a ball to it and knock them over. That's a really fun one to do. Yeah, and I will say I have used those boxes also just to um, hold toys up. So if you have um, a child who prefers things up higher in that, you know, in that upper visual field, um, it really is helpful to put your toys up higher because they're going to be motivated. They'll see that and move up toward it. Um, or sometimes if you have a child who's sitting on the floor, those boxes are just the right height for you to help them feel that there's something on top of it. And then if you're supporting them, they can use that to pull up to stand or, you know, stand at a surface to play with the taller toy, which is really nice. And we have some pillow um, yes. suggestions. Perfect. Pillow squeezing in between for regulation, sensory mm -hmm. regulation, self-regulation. That's a really good one, yep. Um, standing on pillows to work on balance. Definitely. Love that. Um, we hold my son up horizontally a few feet over the pillows in the bed and drop him to land into it like a crash pad. Yeah. That, <laughs> I like that. <laughs> that deep pressure, that's a great one for that. Yep. Yep. And parents can get away with that kind of stuff. Yeah, I can't <laughs> tell you guys to do that, but I definitely love to do that. And it really, pillows do help with that protective response too that we were talking about earlier, is it helps you and the child just feel more safe if you are working on developing that. Like, when they're falling in a direction, they're not going to get hurt, but it also does encourage them to put their arms out when they're falling. So even oh when, like Colleen was talking about with the protective responses, if you're just working on sitting with your child, putting pillows to the right, to the left and behind, that way you, they're not relying on you to sit up. Maybe they're working more on their own balance. And like Colleen said, you can feel safe that if they fall over, they're going to fall into the pillows. And you can be in front of them then as well and working on something with them in front or getting them motivated to look for you in front of them versus if you're behind them, not looking behind you or behind them. Yeah, yeah Kate, the baby, baby added on to that. Oh, go ahead. Um, by standing on or kneeling on the pillows for balance, throwing the pillows for upper body work. Yep. Yes. Um, I was going to share too, one of the babies that I helped um, the family teach them to crawl, pillows were like totally instrumental. We actually used them as the boundaries, kind of like how we showed the video of the hula hoop earlier. Um, but we actually made pathways out of pillows because the couch pillows like made her feel really safe. So we actually made, and that's how she ended up crawling and learning to crawl over things. Um, so that was one of those like really nice boundaries that we used pillows for. Yep. And to add on to that, another comment was using the pillows for tummy time on, oh, in yes. different angles. Yes, <laughs> sure. Oh, you guys are good at this game. I like it. <laughs> All right. If, is there any other ideas? Otherwise, I'm going to move on to the next. We're almost done here. These are um, one or two more. Yes. If the child can maintain holding onto the pillow, slowly pulling the pillow to teach the child movement in preparation for crawling. Yes. Yes. That's a great one too. See, you guys have so many good ideas. Yep. Yeah. I don't know why they're not talking. <laughs> they must love my voice. I, it must be. Well, and I think, <laughs> I think it's like, you know, Trisha, it's one of those things that's like the etiquette, but I'm actually one of those presenters, you know this, that I love when people just like interrupt me and talk and because that's what makes it fun. I don't like listening to myself. I know you guys don't like listening to me for an hour or two either. So <laughs> maybe they all know that I'm just not afraid to interrupt you. <laughs> I'll let you move forward. So the next one we have is a step stool. So it can be a step stool like this where it has two steps or just a one step step stool. I have this at my house. 
Uh, we have one from Julia says, we used step stools against the couch to teach crawling, climbing, to get up to stand and or climbing all the way up to the couch. Perfect. Perfect. That's awesome. <laughs> Um, another one too is to use have a step stool in your car in the back seat of your car so your child can work on climbing into and out of the car by themselves or into and out of the car seat by themselves. So sometimes with the cars being so high, it's really easy to stick a step stool right on the ground and then you can pull it out and have them work on that. Ooh, then they can drum all the way to the store. Mm -hmm. in the yes <laughs> or you can get the collapsible one so it folds flat and slides under the seat then they can't drum on it <laughs> i am always a big fan of working on kids cognitive skills and really focusing on problem solving um, and something that's really hard for our um, our students or children who are totally blind sometimes is learning how to use a tool to accomplish a task um, can anybody think of a way that you could use this to problem, like a child could use this to accomplish a different task or problem solve through and think through a problem? Well, we have a couple of things here, and I don't know if it's to your last question or oh, sure. this one. Um, Julie says, sit on step to work on core balance. Core yeah, and balance. Shoes. And you can have yeah. them work on reaching to and that crossing midline. Yep. Um, and then Katie says, teach to wash hands at sink or yeah, at so many hands. objects yep. to carry from spot to spot, place next to window. Yes. The window then, is highly motivating for a lot of kids. Um, so using like having them step up to look out the window um, or to pull like suction cups off the window that are higher up. They can work on climbing up the step and then pull the suction cup off with you obviously helping them so they don't lose their balance backwards. I, um, did anybody add anything in there, Trisha, about what I was asking about like using it as a tool like to problem solve? Well, this one might be from that okay. question. Um, we have a learning tower type of stool with, with a black or sorry, with a back, but we placed a giant bucket of bubble gum at the kitchen counter to help teach my son to push the learning tower over to get the gum. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So yes, whenever you can use a, a step stool is great. Um, so helping children, you don't think of this necessarily as a tool, um, but when things are up high, they have to figure out how to get them. And since our children who have low vision or are totally blind don't have that incidental learning that we were talking about where they see other people getting things off counters, we have to teach them that you can use a step stool to reach something up high. And I know when you have toddlers, you get nervous to work on things like this, but it is very important for them um, to learn how to do that problem solving. And we really have to walk them through it because otherwise they might not even know what's up on that counter and know that that's where you have the cookie jar or the bubble gum, like you were saying. Um, you can also help them just be more independent, getting into their own bed. Um, working on some of those self-help skills, um, helping them get books off of bookshelves. That's another way to kind of use that as a problem-solving tool. Well, we have a question about the cognition regarding cognition. Yeah. Which way is the step stool correctly used? Oh, that's a good one. How to kind of put the step stool the way mm -hmm. that you, yeah, that would be a really good activity um, to figure out which way, how's the easiest to get up and They'll yeah. figure it out quickly, too, with that one, probably, especially with the higher up. Or they'll figure out, if I go up the higher one, then I got to come down in the front to get whatever I'm at. So that's a really good one. Yeah, and that helps them learn where to put their hands and, like, their other body parts to support themselves when they're up, you know, like, and understanding that concept that they're up high. Like, they don't always know how far off the ground they are when they're on the step stool. So really helping them familiarize with it beforehand, like, feeling the height of each step. Um, and especially in relationship to something else they know, like maybe how high their bed is, or um, those help really develop some of those cognitive, um, the concept development as well. So do you have, do you, either of you have any tips um, regarding the fear coming from some of these new parents um, and having a child with a vision impairment and allowing some of these type of activities to even happen can be very scary for parents. Do you guys have any tips for them? 
Yes, every child falls when they're learning to crawl, walk, stand. Um, and you can't be worried about that happening. Um, children really learn through natural consequences. Um, and I know there's certain parents who are probably thinking, oh my gosh, she lets these little babies hurt themselves. But no, I don't. It's just having them do this and learn this in an environment where you're there and it's a safe environment that you've created will also help not only ease their fear, but also yours. Um, so really taking these things in this PowerPoint into consideration when, and you'll all have access to it on the live finder, um, you know, set this up yourself um, because in that environment, you can control what happens with your child um, where eventually, you know, they're going to need to learn these things. And I'm sure you'd feel better to know that they're learning it with you or with a PT in a safe way before they're learning it. Um, on their own, because I will tell you when kids find things like this, they will start to go up. Um, and I think that you would want to be there to help them, you know, learn how to do it in a safe way. Like we said, where to put your hands, where to put your feet, how to position the step stool. Um, and just take it a little bit at a time. Um, you know, I know it can be very scary, <laughs> um, but we know that you also want your children to be as safe and independent as possible. So um, just ask for tips when you need it. Work with that team that you have access to. Um, you know, work with a teacher of the visually impaired, a physical therapist whenever you can. Um, those are things that, that we can help you with and know how to do this safely um, and know what boundaries to set for yourself and your child. So I have Jen a couple of, yeah, I have a couple of things for that. Um, like Colleen said, it's okay to fall. Um, but making it safe. So if your child is just working on, they're working on sitting up and we talked about those protective responses at the beginning, if they don't have those yet, um, a lot of parents sometimes are really fearful to like let their child tip over to the side. You can do that in a controlled way by if they start to tip to the right, you can let them keep going, but slow maybe how fast they're falling down. So they still tip all the way and then say, oh, you tipped over. Like we got to stay in the middle. So you bring them back to the middle. Or if um, a lot of kids that like that upper visual field, they like to put their head, if they're looking up towards something, they like to go way or lower visual field. Sorry. They like to go way up here and then they end up tipping backwards. Um, that's another one that you can be behind. It's okay to let them fall backwards. It's, uh, like, it's okay to let them fall backwards um, and you can control how fast they're going. So you can do it, let them fall backwards slowly or let them just go a little bit and see if they correct themselves first. Um, another one too is I, that I get a lot of times is parents are even fearful to take their child to the park, um, especially if a lot of other kids are around. Um, you can take your child to the park maybe early in the morning for the first, like for the, a while until they get used to that park so that maybe you're the only, the only one there or um, there's maybe a couple other kids there if you go earlier in the morning or if you can during a weekday, kind of whatever fits into your schedule and just explore the park with your child, um, climb up the stairs with them, you know, maybe holding their hands the first couple of times so they get familiar and really telling them like, telling them we're going up the stairs, um, we're going down the slide, um, getting them used to all those different things that are at your local park that you may be taking to them there. And then maybe setting up a play date with a friend or a family friend that has a child around the same age where maybe it's just you guys going to the park together and your kids are together. So you guys can work on that with just one other child maybe, or, and then once you feel more comfortable and once your child feels more comfortable going to the park, maybe on a busier time and still being right there, but also letting your kid explore the playground. Yeah. And I, I, oh, sorry, Trisha, let me just add one more thing. I really yeah. feel like parents too, if you can do some of these things by yourself before you're doing them with your child, like practice setting up the environment beforehand so that you know you have all the materials. Like, I don't want to say role play, but, you know, kind of work yourself through it before your child is there. Like, if they're napping um, or they're, you know, at a, a class or wherever they are, um, just kind of go through it yourself a little bit first so that you're like, oh, okay, I know if they do this, this is what I'm going to do, you know, so problem solve yourself through it too. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. That's okay. Um, we have a comment from Julie. My son with CVI turns four next week and is currently roller skating around my kitchen. Awesome. Let, let him fall when he's small because it hurts 
lot less. They when, can get up a lot faster. <laughs> than when they're taller and they learn very, very quick. So oh, Julie, thank you. <laughs> and then Katie, what are your best recommendations for vestibular activities for the summertime? Does well with swinging, but other tasks, question mark. A few ideas, question mark. Rolling is a really good one. So rolling um, belly to back, back to belly. So down a hill. Rolling. <laughs> um, you could do down a hill. Uh, a fun rolling game that I like to set up is putting puzzle pieces or something on one side and having them roll to get it. And then they have to roll back and either put that puzzle piece in the board or they put something in a bucket. Um, so I usually make it like two rolls each direction that they have to do. And a lot of the kids get really into that. Um, they like the movement. Um, swinging is always a good one. Jumping is a good one. Bouncing on a ball. Um, just With making exercise balls. That's so much fun. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Katie said perfect. Thanks. Good ideas, Jenna. <laughs> yep. Did anybody else have any other just general questions? Um, and they can be about the gross motor or about incorporating vision into it. Um, or did anyone have questions about they need other ideas for certain specific activities for somebody who maybe doesn't have any vision um, or maybe has other impairments? Any questions? Yeah. Do you have any ideas for folks that have stairs and can be scary? Yes, practice on things that are lower first. So you know how we show these like um, these the uh, phone books wrapped, you know, in duct tape or um, contact paper. Do very small steps first, so where they're just barely stepping up. Um, mm -hmm. I would say start with that and work up, you know, to taller steps. Starting with shrinking your staircase down, so only doing like two or three steps, and then putting if. I like to make it fun. So putting something in the bucket at the three steps up or four steps up and then coming back down to get the next one or putting, um, you put race cars at the top or like a ball at the top and then watch the ball go down the steps at the end to come back down and then they have to come back down to get the ball. But starting the shrink your staircase down. So only do three or four steps until they're comfortable with that and then increase it. Um, a lot of kids too, um, I have a couple of kids that really like music, so I'll have music that I'll turn on on my phone and I'll put it at the top of the steps and if they want, or I'll have it in my pocket and if they're going up the steps, I'll leave it on and um, then we'll pause it if they don't want to go and then we, I ask them, do you want to do more steps or are you all done? And if they tell me all done, then we'll come back down. If they want more, then I'll turn the music on and we'll keep going up the steps. So kind of putting those concepts together. Um, or if you have two people having somebody with a maraca or something at the top of the steps or like three or four steps in front of them going up the stairs and then you're with the child. Um, with stairs really quick, um, when you're going up the stairs with a child, you want to be behind them. And when you're coming down the stairs with a child, you want to be in front of them. So you always want to be on the downside of the steps so that you can catch them if they fall. Um, and they feel comfortable with that, too. And show them where the handrails are. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> the handrails, yes. So speaking of vestibular, what do you guys feel? How do you guys feel about the army crawl going down the steps? crawl going down oh like backwards like starting at the top and then um hand walking down on their stomach if there's carpeting uh, i if that's how they're going to come down that is fine to start with but then i would start with climbing down maybe backwards so they're climbing down the steps versus army crawling on there scooting all the way down um is fine for the first couple of times, but then you really want to work on that gross motor skill of how to get down because when they're older, they're not going to be able to do climbing or they're not going to be able to slide down the stairs on their belly. Or if they're out at school or if they're somewhere where they have to go up and down the steps, they really got to start building that confidence to come down the steps. Um, so you can climb down backwards or you could have them turn around and have them start stepping down and like Colleen said starting with something that's lower and working on stepping down off a lower surface is going to be easier to build and then building up to that higher surface um 
the high contrast on the stairs will help too coming down. Um, holding the railing, holding on to a hand, holding on to a bucket when you're coming down is always a fun one. So, good questions. I'm just waiting a minute to see if anything else pops up in the chat or somebody wants to speak out loud, go ahead. <laughs> 